Welcome back guys and gals. We're going to be looking at the Classic 2. This is just a quick update video for those of you who are interested in this project, who are following it. There's not that many of you, but I know some of you might appreciate this. Um, I, uh, I did some, some kind of footwork, homework, whatever you want to call it, and I confirmed one of my suspicions. Now, I may have mentioned this in the previous video, but this Quantum Pro Drive LPS is not from the factory. This is a um, this is a this drive was sold through a third party vendor, and I can tell because it does not have the Apple stamp on it with the size next to it. Usually, they have the Apple logo with a, a numerical size 40, 80, 160, 120. This has none of that. Now, what that Apple seal of approval also tells you is that it'll have Apple's proprietary firmware loaded on, which, to the end user, does two things. One thing, really. Without the Apple proprietary firmware, the Apple HD SC setup utility, which is located on your disk tools disk, will not run on that drive without Apple's uh, firmware. However, you can still format it through the finder and use it as a system drive. That is not an issue. Secondly, the drive sled or the drive carrier is a little unusual. And, I, and it looked funny to me at first for two reasons. Usually, the drives are mounted upside down in these, and this one is not. Usually, um, the uh, drive is mounted forward and kind of a little bit towards the uh, towards the right of the of the cabinet, and it's not. Usually, <laughs> the drives the, the carrier's finish will match the rest of the uh, internal chassis, and it does not. So I have confirmed that this machine was likely sold as a hard drive delete option machine. Uh, this was the $999 version. It probably didn't have 4 megs of RAM. It probably only had 1 or 2. Um, but thank God somebody had the foresight to buy the riser card and fully populate it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but... This one did not have a hard drive. Yes, you could still buy a Mac in 1991 without a hard drive. And it basically meant that the machine could, would probably be used with an external drive, or perhaps it would have been, would have been used like an old Mac Plus, where you would um, boot it from a floppy and then you know, insert your whatever program you want to run, run it from within memory. Yes, that's what computing was like at one time. If you were lucky, if you were rich enough, you had an external floppy drive, which would have connected to this connector right here. If you were poor and didn't really use intensely large applications that didn't require hard drives, you could simply use it, uh, you know, from floppies, and that's and that was an option. That was what some people did. But for those who bought the Max, maybe initially at, a, at the reduced price of $1,000, and then they'd save up for the hard drive as they needed it, they would go to a third-party Apple repair shop, or maybe even an Apple dealer, in fact. And they would have been able to buy a hard drive kit, and that would have come with, come with a hard drive and this hard drive carrier. The hard drive carrier that is in here is made from a very thick... I think it might be aluminum, or it could be a. I think it might be steel actually. It's been uh, it's been electroplated. Um, you know, you got you got the carrier, you got the drive. Probably paid a pretty penny for it. Maybe you pop in some extra RAM, and maybe we start using uh, real software. I don't know, or modern software. I got to be careful. I word these things. Anyway, so that's what I think happened here. So this was and this was the cheapest base model they had and it was later upgraded, which is the spirit of computing, well, up until recently, where people buy closed boxes like iMacs, and they can't upgrade the memory, and they can't replace the hard drive. They can't do anything without breaking the seal and voiding the warranty and possibly cutting their wrists in the process, either out of frustration or by breaking the glass by accident. Uh, yeah, so. Working on Macs these days isn't what it used to be. 
In other news, um, we started getting caps. I ordered, I needed one. I ordered 10. I got 14. <laughs> That's funny. I needed one of these. This is a um, one microfarad 50 volt. And this is uh, actually the only one of that size. It goes right there. And that's what I got. I got 14 of these. So I can, I can screw it up 13 times. On the 14th try, I'll send it out. Just kidding. I've done enough of these. I think I know how to do it. Um, eh, okay. So I'm still waiting for my order of 47 microfarad 16 volt caps. Um, there are seven of those. This is actually the one I accidentally ordered, but it was only like a couple bucks. One microfarad, 16 volt. A little word on that. So, I mentioned this in my previous video, but I guess I wasn't clear on it enough, uh, so I'm going to clear that up. When you're replacing caps, you can go up on the voltage rating, but not down. The schematic that I, not schematic, but the, the capacitor list that I was looking at, it referenced a one microfarad 16 volt cap as this one here. However, the one that is on this board is a 50 volt one microfarad. So I do not believe that the information is correct. If anyone else has one of these boards and can maybe confirm that with me, it's possible that they made a production change. That does happen from time to time. And I don't suspect this one of being replaced, but it's always possible too. So I'm going to just put, go ahead and put in the 50 volt that I ordered because that's what's in there now. You can't go down, but you can go up. There is a lot of leeway there. Um, so other than that, this board, once I get that all done, I might, I'm going to, um, I'm going to clean it, clean the, uh, I wish I had an ultrasonic cleaner. That would have been helpful, but anyway. Thirdly, um, we need some deoxid. I need deoxid, and it's funny, it's really sad. Five months ago, uh, one of deoxid's sales representatives contacted me through email and offered to send me free products in exchange for um, a demonstration video endorsement. This happens a lot with YouTubers. Um, if you focus on one particular subject and you start to gain a following, advertisers and companies who are searching for ways to market their products will sometimes stumble upon your channel and, um, and offer to send you free product in exchange for a quick video endorsement. Well, at the time, I didn't I wasn't doing anything at all that would benefit from deoxid, and I didn't decline, I just didn't respond. But that was five months ago. Well, here we are. <laughs> Timing is everything when you're in this business. Um, so I, uh, I sent my request in. I, I've requested a couple of different things. Hopefully they send them. Um, haven't heard of anything back yet, but give it a few days. If I don't hear anything back in about two or three days, I'm going to run to the local electronic surplus store and I'm going to buy a can of deoxid. It is expensive. It is expensive. It is about 20, 25 bucks for a can of deoxid. Uh, uh, depending on which one you get, I think the most expensive one is like $60 retail. So um, we'll see if they follow through on that. I have actually been offered free products before. Um, the other one was something I actually found a use for, and it was that little air duster thing. It was a basically a battery-powered blower, handheld blower, and I used it. I found that it wasn't really useful for its original purpose, but it does a great job of cleaning toy cars. So, yeah, go figure. Um, fourthly, so we're gonna do the caps. These I should have these all in this week. Hopefully, and I'll get that done. I'm gonna probably do it at work where I have all my good stuff. Uh, keyboard. This was remarkable. I got this Mac with the proper keyboard, with the proper mouse, where'd I put, oh, there it is. And they're in mint condition. I cleaned this up and it came out fantastic. Pulled every keycap off. 
this was a bear to do. This was a hard one to clean uh, because the keycaps. I, I, this is an, this is an NMK keyboard. That's who made it. It's not an NMB and it's not an Alps. It's an NMK. And the um, yeah, the the plungers are just really delicate and scary to take apart. But I I got it done and I didn't. I, I just cleaned it with a paintbrush. The the base keep the, the keyboard base plate. I cleaned it with a paintbrush. Just to, I'm finding that paintbrush is the best way to clean a lot of things. And it works really well. Dry, brand new paintbrush works great. The rest of it came out beautiful. There's no yellowing anywhere on this keyboard or the system cabinet or even the mouse. I, I'm a little surprised. A little, I'm, I'm shocked. I mean, look at the condition this thing is in. I took the mouse apart, cleaned it out. Beautiful. Let's take a look at this keyboard though. There is some wear. Um, you can you can tell how many it's like looking at the, the 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 pedals in a car. You can usually tell how heavily used a keyboard is, and if it's attached to a laptop by extension, you can kind of tell how many miles are on that laptop, so to speak. But this keyboard is um, it's got a little bit of shininess to the spacebar that is expected. So you want to look at the spacebar, the return key, the shift keys. You can usually tell if they're left or right-handed. Um, doesn't actually matter. It doesn't mean anything, honestly. Um, but you got a little bit of wear on the A key. It's shininess. This is what you want to look for. You want to look for the look for that 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 dull or that that uh, polished look. It's in pretty good shape. I mean, with the exception of this section of the space bar key, this keyboard is mint. Um, but I say it's a low mileage keyboard. Anyway, compare that to this one here. This is the one, let me grab a flashlight. This is the keyboard that I bought for the Performa. This one went through the full meal deal cleaning as well. Came out, came out beautiful. But look at these keys. Now look at that shift key. Somebody did a lot of, a lot of typing on this one. Come on, it's not really showing up on the camera. But maybe I can angle it. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, it looks worse in person. You, know, you look at that, you look at the uh, look at these two, the A and the S. Ah, it's a little bit a little shiny right there. So this is a keyboard with some miles on it. Maybe not a lot, but it's got some miles on it. That's how I uh, determine and, and it's really not even scientific, but it's how I kind of determine a little bit of what kind of a life that device went through. It's more accurate on laptops where the keyboards are generally not replaced. But on a desktop, you can go through many keyboards over time. So, anyway, that's it for now. It's getting late. I'm tired. It's 11 o'clock. So what do we got? We got a perfect CRT. We got a perfectly good running hard drive. It is quieting down. It is quieting down. It, when I first got it, it was like grinding. But it's quieting down as the grease kind of reconstitute itself it's definitely quieting down a lot. Analog board should be fine. I may recap that later on. Once I get the board recapped and I have everything else tested, I get sound back. And there's one really weird thing happening with this. The, uh, so the floppy drive does work. You put a floppy disk in, it boots off of it, you can install the OS, no problem, not a single error. But once you boot the machine, and you put a disk in the drive, doesn't matter what it is, it doesn't see it. It doesn't mount it. You put a blank disk in, or an IBM formatted disk, and it comes up, would you like to format it? Yes, it formats it, and it doesn't mount. Bizarre. Really bizarre. I'm not sure what that is, but once I recap the board, and I test it again, I'll have a better understanding of what's going on. I think there might be some some issues uh, related to moving data around that board, perhaps, and that's why maybe it's caps. I don't know. Is it the massively corroded power connector? Maybe the machine's not getting the right voltages where it needs to be because there's some impedance caused by some massive corrosion. Is that a possibility? Yeah, well, probably not. 
This, by the way, was caused by moisture exposure and nothing else. This was left in a damp location for a long time, and that's what happened to it. I'm kind of wondering, you know, that got me thinking, is that the case with the data connector on the drive? Let's take a look. I just thought of that. Like, maybe, like, it's not... No, those connectors look good to me. I don't see any corrosion there. Looks clean as a whistle, Homer. Um, so that's that. All right. Well, we have some work to do. We're going to get some deoxid one way or the other, come hell or high water. We're going to clean that connector off, clean the other side off, replace the caps, see what happens. I want to get this thing new again. As close to new as I can get it. These definitely are collectible machines. They are worth preserving at this point in time, and I want to preserve this one. I also might even try to find a parts one. We'll get into that when we get into that. So, anyway, all things I expected, and I wanted a project. They didn't want a turnkey Mac. I wanted a project, and I got what I asked for. So, there we go. Until then, guys. Have a nice day.